Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. So today on the show, we've got the latest domino to fall in Nike's ongoing trademark battle. Skepta subtweeting Nike, but not really. Batman fighting Godzilla, the week's hottest release, and of course, a hard pass. All right, let's start the show like we always do with some hot takes. So big congratulations to those of you who paid $25,000 for J Balvin's Air Jordan 3 Rio release. I missed the drop, but if you employed a bot on Balvin's shop and didn't enter the discount code that they provided for people who paid for $100 in merch, you could have paid 100 times more for your pair. Then again, if you have a credit card with a limit that can handle $25,000 and fraud protection isn't calling you, you're probably not sweating this too much, to which I say, yeah. You probably deserve to pay $25,000 for some Jordans. Living like you're that rich family in Arrested Development that thinks a single banana is $10? Come on. Uh, Skepta, he's making headlines with both his new and old partners in the sneaker world. Thanks to the team at Puma. Wait, did he say what I think he said? Thanks to the team at Puma. What, what was that, Skepta? The team at Puma. Sir Lewis Hamilton? The good thing with Puma is every fourth. Skepta? Puma. Sir Lewis Hamilton? Puma. Okay, good to know. Anyway, his new collection with Puma is selling out, including his Puma Scope Forever sneaker, which was inspired by Puma Golf Shoe from 2006. Ah. I love it when my golf and sneaker worlds converge. But he also raised some eyebrows when he alluded to his previous partner, Nike, saying that while he was now earning royalties with Puma, he did not get the same bag at Nike and that he was treated like an influencer because he was not versed in shoe design. And I get it. Uh, you know, some people are saying Skepta is complaining about his Nike deal after the fact, but my take on it is, he was just explaining how the game works. When you work with the top dog and they establish the terms, you have a choice. Don't take it or take it. Build your name up, earn a rep, make your own path. And if the time comes and the top dog picks up the phone, you call the shot. Not that I have personal experience with that sort of thing or not, you know, not at all. I mean, we'll keep that on the low. Anyway, so the cool Kai and Nike saga is over. After endless litigation and people taking sides with zero understanding of what trademark is or what a trade dress is, the brand has been ordered to pay Nike 1 million and has agreed to no longer make, use, transport, and promote products that infringe on Nike's trademarks. To which I say, great, it's finally over. In the grand scheme of things, Cool Kai taking the $1 million L plus legal fees is a small price to pay for the attention and notoriety they receive from this case. I mean, it's better than $8 million, that's for sure. Now, it's also hard to quantify the value of Cool Kai being featured on all those sneaker aggregate pages through the years, but it's probably worth a lot more than $1 million. This whole episode no doubt up the brand's profile, but now the waiting begins for what's next. There's a lot of people who didn't know Cool Kai before this case. And while buying a shirt or some graphic packages to show support is cool and all, it's the next sneaker that will determine whether this was all worth it. If this notoriety leads to them working with hungry, passionate, and talented designers who came up with an original design that keeps the swoosh, the jump man, the three stripes, and the rest at bay, he could be in for something special. Leave Nike alone, carve your own path, you know, and good luck guys. Shout out to Giancarlo Esposito for recreating the iconic scuffed Air Jordan 4 scene from Do the Right Thing. 35 years later and that film still resonates, especially when you realize that Bugging Out only paid $100 for his Jordan 4s back in the day. Ah, the old days. I'm not gonna say good because things were messed up back then too, but, but also shout out to uh, Boston Celtics guard Derek White for starring in the video. Look. You'd think with his team in the Eastern Finals, he wouldn't have time to star in a throwback video for a movie that came out five years before he was born. But hey, a commitment to the bit is a commitment to the bit. You know, we would know. You know, Akra, Puma, Akra, Akra, Puma, Puma, Akra, Akra, Puma, yeah. Yeah, Puma. Uh, Kyrie Irving debuted a new colorway of an unreleased Anta basketball shoe as the Dallas Mavericks advanced to the Western Conference Finals. Of course, Anta added fuel to the speculation by posting the thinking face emoji on the socials. So, this is either the Anta Kai 2, a takedown Kai model, or a new non-signature product that will be available all throughout Anta's many stores in Asia sooner rather than later and command a premium because... Kyrie wore them. Either way, it's great to see brand variety in these conference finals with signature shoes from Jordan, 
Anta, Adidas, and whatever custom Nike GT cuts Jalen Brown has in store for us between now and when the Celtics get eliminated. Yeah, I said it. More on Kyrie, though, later in the show. Good friend Marquez Brownlee was back on sneaker shopping, and he was asked by Joe LaPuma about what AI could bring to the sneaker world. And the more I think about it, the more it feels like shoes is one of those pure places where you don't need tech. Mm. His answer... His answer was illuminating. I mean, he's right. Did you see those AI concepts of signature shoes from the Nike Air of it in Paris that I got to go to? I only said that to annoy co-writer again because he didn't get to go. Anyways, Marquez is right. I don't want AI in the design rooms because all they're really gonna do is regurgitate the same crap we've already seen a thousand times before. What AI can be for sneakers is a test dummy for helping us find the next air or Adidas boost, namely the next mind blowing cushioning that gets us closer to walking on clouds. Let's go with the pick of the week, and it's the Nike Zoom Kobe 4 Pro Tro Girl Dad. This is on May 31st for 190 bucks. Heads up. As of this recording, Sneaker News has this dropping on May 31st, while other sites have them on June 7th. But whatever, this is the pick of the week, this week, next week, any damn week it drops. It's an homage to a legendary story told by ESPN's Elle Duncan when she ran into Kobe while she was eight months pregnant with her daughter. Elle was asking Kobe for advice, and he was more than happy to give it while espousing the joy of being a girl dad. Nothing more really needs to be said. And also, we talked about it on our weekly heat check show over on the main Cousteau channel. Got a few unboxings there as well. Before we get into hard pass, let's get nerdy with some comic book talk. We missed it, but looks like the Justice League is in the MonsterVerse battling Godzilla and or King Kong. I mean, that sounds about par for the course when it comes to transmedia crossovers. Like, the question isn't why the Justice League is taking on Godzilla and or King Kong. It's why it took so long and why isn't there a movie yet? I take something that ridiculous over the Snyderverse dumpster fire any day of the week. But what really got me was the visual of a giant ass Godzilla buster mecha piloted by guess who? Batman because of course Batman would be smart enough and deranged enough to build a giant ass mecha that's powered by Cyborg and the Flash like he's running in a hamster wheel. Sure it sounds like Bruce Wayne is making the other guys do the actual work while he takes the glory walking around in a mech that looks like freaking Batman. Even in comics, we can't escape in stage capitalism, baby. All right, it's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. like. Our way too early ranking of the narratives going into the NBA Conference Finals. Because you'll be watching this on Sunday when at least three games in each series will have been played. We're going to do a, let's say a big picture ranking of the storylines that are going to play out among the headliners from each team. All right. Number five, Indiana Pacers are the luckiest team to ever reach the Conference Finals. Personally, it doesn't matter to me because a team that makes the Conference Finals and beyond must be doing something right to have reached that point. The Indiana Pacers are a very good team led by an all-star talent in Tyrese Halliburton, former NBA champ Pascal Sakiam, and Lego guy Miles Turner. However, not having to deal with Giannis and only a few games of Dame Lillard in the first round and a grinded to the ground Knicks squad will cause some fans to question just how good they are. Look, it happens sometimes. A team that few people expected to make it this far actually made it this far. These Pacers remind the crew of the 2021 Atlanta Hawks and the 2019 Portland Trailblazers. Hawks won a few games. Blazers got swept. It happens. Pacers almost won game one. It's possible they could be up 2-1 or on the verge of elimination by Monday. All I know is that I'm rooting for the Pacers because I'm a fan of the 17-time NBA champion and one-time in-season NBA Cup champion, Los Angeles Lakers. And I would greatly appreciate it if they or whoever wins between Dallas or Minnesota beat the Celtics. Is that hating? I don't care. Go Lakers. Uh, number four, does... Alex Rodriguez owned the Timberwolves yet? One of the more intriguing stories in the NBA right now is the battle for ownership of the Minnesota Timberwolves. If you had said that sentence prior to say the past three months, you were either a resident of Minnesota or a diehard NBA nerd who needs to get out of the house more often. But here we are and the spotlight is on A-Rod and his business partner, Mark Laurie, as they attempt to pry control of the team away from its current owner, Glenn Taylor, who Kevin Garnett once referred to as a snake. Oh, and not just a snake, but 
a snake. Here, here's the quote, but I don't do business with snakes. I don't do business with snake. I try not to do business with openly snakes or people who are snake-like. Well, well, damn, KG, but also, cool. I'll take your word for it. Anyways, to make a short story long, or is it the other way around, in 2021, Taylor put the Wolves and the WNBA Minnesota Lynx up for sale and found buyers in A-Rod and Mark Lurie for $1.5 billion. Both sides agreed to an unusual installment plan that sounds a lot like a layaway where A-Rod and Lurie would make payments until this past March 27th, when they were supposed to make their last payment and become majority owners. But Taylor backed out of the deal, citing that A-Rod and Lurie were late to make the final payment, while also not subtly calling them bums who can't afford for the team. Meanwhile, A-Rod and Lori contend that they did everything by the book and that Taylor was having buyer's remorse because the team's value had gone up since 2021 and because they were finally contending after 20 years of being ass. And a big reason why they were ass? Taylor. It's a lot of rich people pettiness going on here, but for us common folk, it's also a glimpse into the differences between what Chris Rock once a time called rich versus wealthy. Alex Rodriguez and Mark Lori, Rich. Glenn Taylor? Wealthy. If Glenn woke up tomorrow morning with A-Rod's bank account, he'd go find some real wolves to eat him alive while Kevin Garnett watched. It's unclear how this will play out, but secession level shenanigans happening in real time during one of the NBA's biggest stages? That should be fun to watch. Number three, the narrative switch for Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert, and Nikola Jokic. So shout out to Bomani Jones, who has been steadfast in calling Cat and Gobert 14 feet of disappointment. I mean, sucker, all season long. But in a plot twist, those 14 feet showed up when it mattered the most and helped the Wolves reach the conference finals. Good for them. I still wouldn't want either of them on my Lakers because I still kind of think they're two broken clocks who miraculously happened to be right on time for game seven. But it was nice to see them not be the butt of the joke at least once. All that to say, it's possible, if not likely, that one or both are going to crap the bed during the conference finals, like Carl shooting ill-advised logo threes and committing offensive goaltending at the worst possible times. So enjoy this good feeling while it lasts, Wolves fans. Anthony Edwards could shoot six for 48 and I'd still want the ball in his hands compared to those two. And also, shout out to Mike Conley for gutting through an Achilles strain and showing everybody the value of a veteran point guard. Now, he is somebody I would like to see on the Lakers someday before he hangs it up. Meanwhile, Nikola Jokic is off to see his horses. He's probably already forgotten about this terrible basketball job that he has to do to fund his harness racing habit. And it's probably a good thing because the knives are gonna be out for him this summer, man. Joker's going to be flamed by every talking head and former basketball player turned podcaster who hates that he's a three-time MVP. Like, I'm surprised Carmelo Anthony hasn't posted an emergency episode of his podcast yet to talk about how Denver needs to retire his number now. All those experts who were already rating Joker as a top 15 player of all time are hitting the brakes. While the haters are gonna come with hot takes like Kenyon Martin is the best Denver big man of all time, I mean, sure, that take is probably gonna come from Kenyon Martin, but come on, man, yes. Some members of the media were absolutely so far up their ass for crowning Joker a goat this soon. But to me, Nikola Jokic is still a top five NBA player who's gonna be a real threat to win the championship next season. Unless he's figured out that he can actually retire now with enough money to take care of himself and his family and fund a harness racing league where he dominates like he's Max Verstappen. Number two, so the Kyrie and Luka thing worked out, eh? Yeah. Hey, we'll admit, we were wrong about Kyrie. As great of a singular talent as Kai is, I know his last significant NBA moment was in game seven of the 2016 finals. That go ahead shot was in a black and gold Nike Kyrie 2, seven Nike Kyrie signature shoes ago. He wanted to be the man in Boston, but that didn't work out. He wanted to run Brooklyn with KD, that didn't work out. He wanted to trade and ended up alongside a fellow transcendent offensive genius in Luka Doncic, but that might not work out either. But also, we said this about Kyrie. Kai dedicates time, energy, and money to supporting Black-owned businesses, whether it's through wearing their brands or shouting them out on his various platforms. He does talk the talk. I don't always agree with everything that comes out of his mouth or his IG stories because they sometimes display thoughts that are a mile wide and an inch deep, but his heart is often in the right place. However, symbolically, a star of Kyrie Irving's caliber starting a signature shoe line owned by him would have spoken 
volumes. Nearly a year later, Kyrie has a signature shoe with Anta that we like. He's meshing well with Luca, and they're in the West Finals. We still would have preferred an independently owned Kai one, but it is what it is. No use harping on that now. If I had to guess, the NBA's preference for a finals matchup would be Dallas against Boston because the star power of Kyrie and Luka against the Celtics would be huge. Add to that the animosity Boston fans have towards Kyrie, it's gonna be gold for the league if that happens, man. And finally, Anthony Edwards went six and 24 in a game seven. You know who else went six for 24 in a game seven and had to be bailed out by his teammates? The late Kobe Bryant. The difference, of course, is that Mamba's game seven was in the NBA finals against the Celtics, while Ant-Man's game seven was in the second round. So the magnitude of the situation is way different. But the things that made Kobe a legend was that no matter how bad of a shooting day he sometimes had, I trusted that he would find a way to win. And even if he didn't, at least the misses would be entertaining. I'm not saying Anthony Edwards is on that level yet. No, sir. He's got a long way to go and a lot more winning to reach that point for me. But he's on the way. Believe that. So with no more team to root for, but one team that I'm vehemently against with every fiber of my being, I'm rooting for whoever beats the Celtics. If it's Kyrie and Luka, cool. If it's Ant-Man and Mike Conley, dope. If it's Halliburton and crew out in the East, even better. Hater Jacques, out. All right, that's going to do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week. If you'd like to leave a message or be featured on the show, give us a call at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your social media if you want. No more than 30 seconds. All right, I'll see you next week. Peace.